keep recording. Okay. So welcome back to ENA 489. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, if you can't, um, just uh, mention it on the chat and I will see what I can do here. Um, <clears throat> but hopefully we can uh, proceed. Um, what I thought I'd do initially is talk about the logistics for the second half of the semester. You should be able to see the slides um, on my screen. You can actually see the, the um, <clears throat> you're actually seeing everything that I'm seeing right now because I've got this displayed on um, the screen in front of me. Anyway, so what I want to do is just talk a little bit about the logistics um, and <clears throat> most of this is information that I sent out in the email. Um, I will post the link to the slides um, after class. But basically just again I've given you some information on the COVID-19 uh, or SARS-CoV uh, two, um, which is the official name, um, outbreak. Uh, I'm here at home, not because I'm sick, as you can see, <laughs> hopefully. Um, um, <clears throat> actually fine, but as we talked about in class, uh, when we talked about respiratory systems and I talked about mucociliary clearance, Basically, I'm in that high-risk population because of underlying respiratory uh, issues, both asthma, COPD, from numerous cases of pneumonia when I was a kid, and a alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which basically makes the mucociliary um, clearance not work like it should. So we're here. Um, we're going to keep going for the rest of the semester, and if things calm down, then hopefully we can go back to in-person uh, classroom meetings, which is what I would love to be able to do. Uh, but for the meantime, we, I'm going to do the lectures via, via Zoom. Um, if you want to be in the classroom and gather there, you can do so. Um, the university is proceeding as normal. I've just gotten permission to um, work remotely because of my respiratory issues. Anyway, you can ask questions via chat. Um, I've got chat on so I can see it. And all I ask is please be patient as we all get used to this new format. <clears throat> um, and how this whole thing is going to work. Um, so in terms of office hours, um, I will do office hours remotely via Zoom. I'll try and keep Zoom open. If I can't do that, then what I've given you is the link to personal meeting room and I'll just set that up so that I can do office hours in the regular time uh, from 2 to 3.30, um, Monday, Mondays and Wednesdays. So we'll do that, we'll keep that open. You can also send your questions via email. Um, if you've got work that you want me to check, just please send a screenshot of the work, um, of your work or the question, and I will answer by email. Um, and I will continue to send updates by email like I normally do. So as far as the semester project will continue as planned, um, the, <clears throat> I've posted the link to the group completion form and so if you could fill that out by the end of today, that would be great. And then tomorrow what I can do is finish up uh, group formations. If you need group members, just include that. If you don't have a group, group, group and you want me to put you in a group, just um, fill out the form and I will do that. Um, March 23rd, the interim group report is due, which is really basically background information that I'm asking you to gather, um, make it a much easier time with the poster and proposal. I will post a rubric for that um, sometime probably in the next week. So you'll have some information, but I've also given you information on Lon Kappa as far as what I'm expecting for that report in terms of really what 
data, what information I'm expecting you to gather. Uh, the poster and proposal are due April 20th. Again, I'll provide more information on that uh, over the next couple weeks. And if all goes well, then we will have poster presentations on April 27th. If the university does go into modified operations, then things will change and we will figure out how to modify things at that point. Um, I posted exam one grades. I adjusted the scores by adding five points to everybody's score on, a, on the 50 point basis, so basically a 10% boost. Um, if you have any questions about the grades, let me know. I will um, <clears throat> have, what I'll do is I'll get the exams to Bailey over in the CE office so you can just pick up your exam, you'll be able to pick up your exams from Bailey. Uh, she doesn't have them yet, so just give a day or so before you um, go to pick up your exams. And exams two and three, we will kind of figure out what happens. A lot depends on what happens with um, the university in terms of, and the country really, in terms of modified operations. As I mentioned, we're not on modified operations. I'm just on self-isolation because, as I mentioned, because of my um, <clears throat> underlying respiratory issues. So, um, and just keep aware of the links uh, that I've given you. MSU is posting information. Um, you might want to check those, especially the MSU, check those on a pretty much a daily basis in case things change. Um, just in terms of review sessions, I was going to do the air quality. Um, I am going to postpone that until we kind of sort things out and figure out a um, little more confident on using <clears throat> Zoom remotely um, today because, because of the lectures, I'm not going to um, <clears throat> use the tablet, but in the future when we're doing working problems, I use the tablet, which I haven't done before, and but I use the tablet in order to do the lectures and also um, actually provide you with notes. So the good thing is you'll get a copy of a recording of all the notes. Um, so Thursday, um, Mr. Engel is going to do a review session on engineering econ and surveying. Engineering econ is on both the CE and the e, &E exam. Uh, surveying is just on the CE exams. So um, I'm I'll ask him to do engineering econ first so that if you're attending just for that session, then uh, you can leave. If you're taking the environmental exam, you can leave after engineering econ. Uh, so any questions? And if you have questions, if you can post them in the group chat. Um, otherwise, We'll move to the regular lecture. Um, okay. Let's see, we got a couple questions. Okay, one question, how many points uh, was the exam out of? The exam was out of 50 points. What is posted is actually the percentage point, the percentage. So if you have greater than a hundred, that's because you actually had, um, is when I added the 10 points, and basically I just added 10 points, I didn't cap anything at 100 points, that meant that your raw score was 100, it was 10 points less than that on a percentage basis. So uh, what is posted is actually on a percentage basis. Other questions? Where is the exam one score? Um, Okay, the exam score one score should be or is in the folder called exams. If you um, <clears throat> cannot find it, 
um, let me know and I'll check things out right after class. Uh, another question um, is exam three just the presentation. Exam three is actually in the last third of the course. The final exam is just the presentation. So basically we'll have a third exam during the last week of classes. That will just be on the last third of the course. And the um, final exam will just be the presentation. Basically, you'll only, each group of team will only have to be present for about a half an hour at most. Um, any other questions? Okay, then I'm gonna pull that down and switch slides to And we're gonna see if we can, sorry about this. Why is this not going to presentation mode on this side? Um, let me. Okay, I'm gonna, what is this doing? I'm gonna stop the share and then start it again. Um, okay. So let's see if we can get this to work. I apologize. And why is this not? Okay, now we're back. Okay, sorry about that. Um, let me know if you can see. Um, you should be able to see effects of global climate change. If you can't, please let me know and I will figure things out. But it should just say effects of global climate change with today's lecture. So let's look at, um, <clears throat> move from what we talked about let, um, right before break. So we we've been talking about climate change. We looked at climate change in terms of what causes climate change. Um, so in terms of the chemicals that cause climate change, we talked about um, how those chemicals are increasing and the emission of various chemicals, including CO2, methane. We talked about the effect of water vapor. Uh, so now what we wanna do is look at what are the effects of global climate change and so <clears throat> starting here let's look at the effect of global land uh, temperature so what this is this and typically this is what you're going to see are what we refer to as temperature anomalies so these are the temperature differences relative to some average in this case the average is between 1951, so it's about here, to 1980. So it's the average temperature, and that's why you can see here that's pretty close to zero. It's the difference between that average temperature for a particular year and the average of this period of time from 1951 to 1980. So what do we see here? What we see is in the period of time before 1950, you see that most of the anomalies are negative, meaning that the average temperature for that particular year is, <clears throat> or was less than the average temperature for the period of time between 1951 and 1980. And then what do you see? Starting at about 1976, you start seeing this very significant increase a positive temperature anomaly so that the average temperature is significantly greater than the average for this period of time. Okay, the dark <clears throat> black line is an average, it's a smoothing. So what they've done is they've smoothed the, the averages for five years. So it's basically a five year smoothing that's done here. And then you can see the shadow um, dots being the actual 
averages. So you see positive here, positive anomaly, significantly increased temperatures compared to this average. And also the 19 out of the 20 warmest years have occurred since 2001. So what, and if we're looking, if we just look at this period of time here, it seems to be that the rate at which this anomaly is increasing is actually increasing. So I'm going to try to run this um, animation. So let me just switch over here. And hopefully you can see this. So what this is, is this is um, an animation of global temperatures. So I'm going to play this. Um, if you can't see it, somebody just, if you can just message me on the chat and we'll go from there. But you should be able to see this. Um, and I'm just gonna let it play for a little bit and let you watch it. So blue indicates areas cooler than average and then yellow um, to red is warmer than average. So I'm going to stop. Uh, we'll stop back here. Okay. We stop about um, <clears throat> this point in time was 19 about 1947. What we're starting to see, okay, is you start seeing significant warming in the Arctic regions. Um, you see, typically around most of the waters, you're not seeing a significant warming although you see that it's just, it's highly variable um, across, across the entire globe. So not everywhere is warming to the same level. And you can see some years, it looks like it almost looks like it's cooling. And then you notice before in that previous um, plot, we showed that you start to see a significant increase in the rate of warming after about 1976. So this point in is 1991, you're seeing now significantly more warming across the entire globe. And again, what you're seeing is that these warming trends are not consistent throughout the globe. You're seeing significant warming again, much more to a much more much greater extent in the Arctic region than you actually see in the rest of the globe. And you can see now by 2019, you see a very significant about a four degree Fahrenheit temperature increase in the Arctic regions. So I'm gonna move that back and we should be back to the PowerPoint, okay. <clears throat> now let's look at glaciers. Okay. And glaciers are remnants of the last ice age um, they're thick sheets of ice um, that advanced and receded several times over the last um, 10,000 years. And this is a, a University of Washington study looked at 37 mountain glaciers. So this is similar to what you see here. This is South Cascade Glacier. And what they found was that the observed retreat <coughs> can be attributed to climate change with a greater than 99% certainty. Um, they considered this retreat of mountain glaciers to be among the purest sign of climate change. <clears throat> and, 
skipped over this one. I wanted the Uppsala. Uh, the Uppsala Glacier is in South America. Uh, it's actually the largest glacier in South America. And these are two images shown from 1990, uh, 1931 and then 2016. So you can see significant uh, recession where this glacier, the glacier is way back here now. Um, so the glacier has receded about 4.5 miles between 1986 and 2014. So 28 years receded about um, 4.8 miles and half of that was actually since 2001. Um, it's important to know too, glaciers like the Uppsala Glacier provide a significant amount of uh, drinking water, water used for agriculture for much of the population in South America. So this is the South Cascade Glacier. It is in Northwest Washington. Uh, this is a series of images taken um, from 1928 through 2014. So back in about 1959, the USGS started monitoring um, several glaciers to look at what was happening to these and really starting to look at the effects of climate change. They've been uh, monitoring, doing a mass balance, and monitoring these glaciers to determine the mass balance. And what you see in the image on the lower right is you see a significant loss in the mass of the glacier. Uh, what you see here, you can kind of, you start to see it here. Um, what happens is it shrinks first at the terminus here and it recedes back. So the head doesn't shrink as rapidly. Um, but it recedes from <clears throat> the terminus and then back and back here, sorry. Okay. Um, and this South, <clears throat> South Cas Cascade Glacier has actually lost about nearly half its volume and about a quarter of its mass. And the reason they're not equal is because compaction actually results in um, significant increased density with depth. So it's not a it's not a consistent density. This is a plot of cumulative mass balance and notice that this is in meters of water equivalent. I just mentioned this uh, differences in density. So it's because of the differences in density uh, what is done is to monitor these glaciers on the basis of water equivalents. And what you see is a significant loss in water equivalents on these glaciers. So a significant loss in terms of mass balance on the mass and also the volume of these glaciers. We can also look at average global sea Surface temperatures, again, notice this is a, as a temperature anomaly. So again, we're looking at differences. And one of the challenges, as you'll see here, is the averages that are used are not consistent. So in this case, it's a 1971 to 2000 average. So you can see, um, if we look at 1971 to 2000, you see in this region here, it's pretty close. If we were to average this out, it would be anomaly of roughly zero. But what again, similar to what we saw before, you see negative anomalies, anomalies in the years before about 1970. You see some increase here, but generally negative. And then after about 1980, you start to see the significant increase. Um, the range here, the shed, shaded band is represents the uncertainty of the data. Despite the uncertainty, what you see again is a significant increase in the global sea surface temperatures. 
one of the reasons this is important has to do with the impact on um, coral reefs. So high water temperatures in the tropical regions result in chloral, coral bleaching. Uh, the bleaching is caused when the coral polyps actually expel the algae. So the algae and the coral polyps are in a symbi symbiotic relationship. Without the algae, the coral dies. So what you're seeing is significant uh, bleaching in this case gives up these al the algae that give it the color um, that allow it to capture and food and maintain life. The other thing that happens is warmer temperatures results in an increased stress on the organism. That increased stress results in it, in it being more susceptible to infectious diseases. Um, and what we're seeing is, is an increase in infectious diseases among um, these organisms. I'm just going to stop. If you have any questions, post those in the group chat, and I will answer those uh, as we go. Um, and I see two questions about exams two and three. How will they be taken? I don't know. It all depends on what happens over the next few weeks, whether we can do those in class, online. Um, I wish I could give you an answer. But I will try and give you, keep you posted as well as I know things. Um, let's see. <laughs> I'll stop uh, with warming oceans. And another question about participation. I've got to include that. I'll add that on the slides. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, on Fridays, I will post a question on LANCAPA in the participation. You'll have at least 12 hours on Friday to answer the question. Um, it won't be. Um, <clears throat> Um, it won't be a hard question. Uh, most it'll be like the participation points, but I'll just do it that way. And uh, typically, it'll be on it'll be on Fridays. Um, question: What did I refer to? Um, trying to figure out the question. I apologize. Um, I think with the subclass was mountain glaciers. So what I had mentioned, um, we talk about polar glaciers, and then we also talk about mountain glaciers. And it's really these mountain glaciers that are being used as a um, indicator of climate change. So yeah, so it, it was mountain glaciers. OK, back to. Um, the ocean, hopefully this is working as best I can, but um, we'll keep going. So back to the slides. And um, this is a plot of what's referred to as ocean heat content. Um, it's really, what it is, is an attempt to quantify the heat absorbed by the oceans and then it's stored as internal energy. Uh, so this is actually the heat content in the first 2,000 meters. You'll also see plots for the first 700 meters. But what you again, what you see here is a significant increase in the heat content, in this case from about 19, again, about 1980 onward. So you see, you saw a significant increase in the temperatures. You're seeing a same a significant increase in the amount of heat absorbed and stored by the oceans. And this plays a significant role, um, one, in terms of thermal, in terms of sea level rise, because warming <clears throat> oceans result in thermal expansion of that water and then sea level rise. 
The other thing that's looked at is what's referred to as the power dissipation index. Um, this is really an attempt to try and quantify cyclone strength, duration, frequency. Um, and this is applied from 1949 through 2015. Uh, I wish I had more recent data, but nothing has been updated since about 2016. But what you see here is both power dissipation index and you're seeing sea surface temperatures. So you see that this fluctuates significantly, but what you see is that the power dissipation index appears to be increasing with time. Um, especially after about 1995. So you see this significant increase. Um, sorry, this is surface temperature. This is power uh, dissipation index. And, but it's hard to know. Is it really that we're seeing more intense storms? Are we monitoring them differently? Um, and the other thing is we don't have the data for anything beyond 2015. So we're lacking the last four years worth of data. This is just another way of looking, trying to assess this. This is the accumulated cyclone energy. Um, this bottom is what's referred to as below normal. This is near normal, so kind of what is expected in terms of energy. And then this is above normal. And what, do you, what you see is it appears to be that there's more above normal events or indices in the recent years. Uh, again, we're lacking the last four years worth of data, so it's hard to know what has been happening in, a, in the recent time period. Um, I mentioned the issue with thermal expansion of water. What you see here is the global uh, average sea level change. So what do we see here? Again, okay, and this is not an anomaly. This is actually a sea level change. Well, I guess it's anomaly. It's change based on 1880. So we set, set it at zero at 1880, and then we're looking at that increase from 1880. So in effect, it's similar to the temperature in terms of an anomaly. Um, this is seen as a critical uh, consequence of climate change. What do we see? We see significant increasing um, <clears throat> sea level um, increases. Um, so as temperature warms, the water from melting ice sheets, polar ice caps, and glaciers enter, we're going to see, we are seeing a significant rise. Um, and you can see that it's actually risen over eight inches since 1880. Um, and what you see is that a significant amount of that rise has been um, in the recent decades, so, and it's actually, if we, if we were to take the slope of these earlier years versus the slope here, you see a significant increase in the, um, <clears throat> the rate at which sea level is rising. The impact of this is not consistent across, and this is just for the US, it's not consistent across the globe. Um, for instance, if we were to look at Seattle, and this is plotted as the average number of flood days per year, 1950s versus um, 2010, and you see that there isn't a significant change. There's not that much change, for instance, in La Jolla, uh, California. But then if you look along the eastern seaboard, you see very significant increases. So sometimes referred to as the local sea level rise or a relative sea level rise. Um, 
<clears throat> but this is significant. This was significant if you look at um, what we're seeing is with storm events, you're seeing greater sea surge, <clears throat> storm surges because of the increases in sea level rise. Um, the result of that is loss of land, and you can see this here. Uh, if we, and again, you see significant differences. If we look at mid Atlantic, the orange, um, it's quite different than what you're seeing in the southeast. So, this is the amount of land lost in the south, in, sorry, in the southeast over the period of time from 1996 to 2011. Results in greater flooding, so you see more um, severe events such as um, the flooding from Hurricane Sandy on the East Coast. Um, you see a loss of habitat. <clears throat> um, and you see salt water in, in infiltration. So for example, in Florida, uh, along Biscayne, the Biscayne Bay, you see saltwater intrusion about a thousand feet inland. Um, that's actually affecting crop growth. Um, the salt is toxic to crops, so you see decreased uh, production. Um, areas of Maryland are seeing similar effects, and in fact, um, there are areas of Maryland, Virginia, that are no learn, or at least people are questioning whether, whether or not those areas can continue to be habitable. Um, and that results in displaced persons, societies, um, and it's even greater scale if you start looking at, for instance, areas in Italy, uh, in, in, in India, in Indonesia, Bangladesh, where you've got very poor populations in some of these regions, and you're seeing significant uh, flooding of and loss of habitat, loss of <clears throat> um, also loss of arable land. Um, warmer temperatures have an impact on human health. Uh, this is a plot of deaths classified as heat related. So there's a change in the way that these uh, measurements, or the really not the measurements are done, but the reporting is done. But what you see here is the orange line um, shows deaths for which heat is listed as the main cause of death. And then the blue, and this is the chain, is heat was a cause or a contributing factor in death. But what you see is that there seems to be a significant increase over time. Um, and this was just an exceptionally warm year and <clears throat> seemed thought to be the reason for this increase right here. One of the challenges is that these deaths are not um, equal, or not all populations are equally vulnerable. So what you see typically is that the elderly population is more vulnerable. Uh, so you tend to see more a higher death rate for a over 65 population. You also see that, for instance, that there is a difference and an increase in non-Hispanic Blacks over a general population. Um, those with, for instance, with cardiovascular disease are much, are affected to a much greater extent than the general population. And these <clears throat> rates are not, um, or the effects are not consistent across the entire, and this is just in the U.S., but are not consistent across the U.S., you see actually significant increases in um, states like Kansas, uh, Louisiana, Missouri, Tennessee, uh, Louisiana, Florida, Virginia. These are hotter, humid uh, areas, and that tends to, 
it's thought to be a contributing factor to these increases. We're also seeing for increases, for instance, in cases of Lyme disease. You've got changes in habitat, so you've got organisms that can survive in areas that they previously couldn't inhabit, and you see a significant increase in the number of cases. And it's not, again, this isn't consistent throughout the US. You see, for instance, in New England states like um, New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont, they've actually seen the greatest increases. And um, in some cases, they're seeing five to 100 more cases, and this is per 100,000 people, than they observed before the 1990s. This is a plot of the ragweed season. Again, as we showed before, the, climate ch the effect of climate change isn't consistent across the entire globe. It's not even consistent across the entire US. What you tend to see is greater increases in temperature in the more northern regions. So you can actually see here, looking changes in the ragweed pollen season increased by about 24, 25 days in areas of Canada, whereas to a lesser extent, for instance, in Michigan, this is an anomaly. It's not known why, um, but it tends to increase um, as you move further north, where you're seeing a, signif a greater significant increase in temperature. Ragweed thrives in hot, wet weather. That's typically what you see to a greater extent due to climate change. So it's not surprising that you see this increase in ragweed season. And we talked about ozone in the troph trophosphere. Warmer temperatures, greater ozone production, and <clears throat> the ozone levels are anticipated to increase. That will worsen um, asthma. That'll result in more in, or an increase in hospitalizations. Um, this is based on what is referred to as the A2 emission scenario which basically says that the population increases, uh, economic and te technological developments are slow, and CO2 emissions and concentrations continue to increase. So you see, you don't see a significant increase in uh, economic development or prosperity, but you do see a significant increase in CO2 levels and emissions. And you see here a significant increase, in this case about 10% increase in the hospitalizations resulting from increased ozone levels. And so also studies done on water supplies. So this is a projection of changes in water withdrawals. The difference here is climate change. So this is done, and this is actually an A1B scenario. Don't worry so much about which ones are which, but basically um, this looks at changes in population, changes in socioeconomic conditions. Those are the same across the board. The difference is no climate change here, climate change here, okay? Um, and what you see is a significant change in water withdrawals that would result in a significant decline or in um, the availability of water, greater risk to sustainability. So you can see again here significant um, increases in the risk index. So meaning that 
these areas here are likely to suffer from <clears throat> shortages of water. And that shortage of water due for municipal supplies, agriculture, and industry. Um, and you resulting in a greater water stress. And you can see really the Southwest suffering the greatest, um, around cities suffering in this case, um, but most of the water stress would be in the western part of the U.S. We can also see significant changes in consecutive dry days. So again, this looks at significant, or the assumption is significant reduction in emissions versus a continued emission. You're gonna, the project, projection here is you'd have a significant increase in consecutive dry days, resulting in drought, resulting in decreased agricultural production and increased stress on both production, water usage, and general lifestyle. I'm going to stop there. We'll pick, and then I've got another couple questions. Um, questions: Are there extra credit opportunities? Um, let me think about that. And then the question is: What was the average on exam one? Uh, the average with the correction was seventy percent with about, if I remember right, 12 out of 66 grades being above 90% and pretty much spread out down, downward. Um, it's definitely not a Gaussian distribution there. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> changes I should be making in this besides coming back to class. Okay, let's stop there. I'll pick up on Wednesday with the rest of this lecture. We'll look at um, <clears throat> how we're addressing climate change. So we'll just finish um, looking at, we've only got about another four slides or so, but we'll look at the additional um, impact on agriculture and <clears throat> we will, um, question is, will these be posted online before class? Yes, I just forgot to do it today. Um, they're actually, most of these slides are actually already posted, but I will post the rest of these right after class. Um, and I did add the correction to the posted grade. So those are final grades um, after I added the correction. Any other um, comments, questions? Okay, well, I'm gonna stop the recording. I will keep this online if you have questions. I did open up the new homework. Um, on climate change. So that's open. That's due a week from today. And um, hopefully I'll be back in class soon and because hopefully everything will go well. So thank you and till Wednesday. <laughs>